Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Christina Sid, and I'm the Director of Programs here at the High Desert Museum. Thank you so much for joining us today for Dr. Doug Ptolemy's presentation entitled, A Guide to Restoring the Little Things that Run the World. This program is just one of the many programs that the museum is offering that highlights the critical role that pollinators play in the environment. If you haven't already seen it, I encourage you to come on down to the museum and visit our newest exhibition, In Times Hum, The Art and Science of Pollination by visual artist Yasna Guy and entomologist Lincoln Best. The exhibit offers visitors an opportunity to learn more about the art in in intricacy and importance of pollination. We're pleased to bring this program to you with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and in partnership with the Native Plant Society of Oregon, the High Desert Chapter, and the Bend Pollinator Pathway. The Native Plant Society of Oregon is dedicated to the enjoyment, conservation, and study of Oregon's native plants and habitats. Locally, the High Desert Chapter hosts speakers, field trips, social events, and workshops. They have memberships starting for as little as $25 a year. And the High Desert Chapter is a place to make friends that share your interest in native flowers, grasses, and sedges, shrubs, and trees. The goal of the Bend Pollinator Pathway is to establish and connect native pollinator habitats across Central Oregon. A pollinator pathway is a collection of pesticide-free native plants on the adjacent lands of residents, residents, businesses, parks, and open spaces that combine to form a quarter of habitat within the range of most of our native pollinators. No garden is too small. Container plants on a porch or balcony are integral to providing nectaring and nesting resources. The Bend Pollinator Pathway is entirely volunteer effort and would love your participation, whether planting at home, attending planting parties in public spaces around town, or collecting native seeds to foster growth. There are plenty of opportunities to become involved in local pollinator habitat creation. And in just a moment, when I, um, I'll post the links to these partner organizations in the chat. And now I'm really pleased to offer um, more insights into our speaker today. Um, Dr. Doug Tallamy is a TA Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 104 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for more than 40 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, was published by Timber Press in 2007 and was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Darkey, was published in 2014. And Nature's Best Hope, a New York Times bestseller, was released in February 2020. And his latest book, The Nature of Oaks, was released by Timber Press in March 2021. Among its awards are the Garden Center of America Margaret Douglas Medal for Conservation and the Todd Dodd Jr. Award of Excellence, the 2018 AHS BY Morrison Communication Award, and the 2019 Cynthia Westcott Scientific Writing Award. I'm really excited to hear more from, um, from him today. And just so you know, after his presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions through the question and answer feature of Zoom. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Doug Tallamy and thank you for being here. Thank you, Christina. Am I, am I screen sharing successfully here? You sure are. All right, great. Before I start, I want to, I want to give a shout out. I've got a couple of, uh, of in-laws watching today. I think maybe possibly Linda and Gordon, if you're there, it's nice, nice to not see you. Um, okay, I want to talk about uh, a guide to restoring the little things that run the world. We're really talking about making insects. We've destroyed a lot of them, so we've got to put them back. How do we make insects? You know, those are not my, my words, a guide to restoring the little things that, that run, the word, uh, run the world. They come from E.O. Wilson, the greatest entomologist of all times. Um, E.O. is the only scientist, I believe, that has ever won two Pulitzer Prizes. We could give a whole talk on, on his illustrious career. But he wrote a paper way back in 1987 uh, called The Little Things That Run the World. And uh, it was uh, a discussion about what would happen if we lost 
the insects on planet Earth. And his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on those insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. If most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would drastically change energy flow through our, our terrestrial habitats to the point that uh, the food webs that support our, our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, birds, and mammals would all collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost uh, insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. So it was a pretty somber message, but uh, it was largely ignored. Um, this was 1987. Nobody was worried about losing insects. As a matter of fact, we spent a whole lot more time thinking of ways we could kill them. And besides, if we depend on insects, why would we have National Insect Killing Week? And this was 1929, but you know, not much has, has changed. This was a campaign to boost the sales of all brands of chemicals to rid the community of insects. Notice it says insects. It doesn't say pest insects. All insects considered bad. Got to get rid of them. Well, even if we succeeded in killing all insects in agriculture or all insects at home, Nobody was worried about losing insects in nature because we thought that they were still common in, in natural areas. There are two reasons why that's, that's no longer true today. And one of them is we don't have enough natural areas. We have turned those natural areas into our cities and they're certainly not designed to support insects. Into our suburbs, they're not designed to support anything. Um, even our rural areas are, are not natural at all. They're not designed to support insects. Then we have, we have agriculture. You know, we have 770 million acres of rangeland in the U.S. That's four and a half times the size of Texas. It's designed to support cattle, not insects. And it's typically overgrazed, particularly in the West. So uh, again, very few insects. As a matter of fact, food production on planet Earth now claims almost half of the, the Earth's land surface. And none of that uh, space is designed to support insects. Second reason that our natural areas are not doing a good job with insects anymore is that they are invaded with non-native plants. Uh, you certainly know about Himalayan blackberry, but we have, um, we have over 3,300 species of, of plants from other continents which have invaded our natural areas. Uh, they are, you know, those are the invasive plants, but non-native plants uh, everywhere, whether they're invasive or not, are very poor at supporting insect populations. You know, when I was young, scenes like this were common. You looked up at a light and, and that's what you saw. Or you drove and you had to get out and wipe your windshield once in a while because that's what it looked like. That doesn't happen anymore, which is it's an anecdotal um, reflection on, on the fact that we have lost an awful lot of insects. So we really are winning this undeclared war against insects. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? I'm talking about global insect decline. We're starting to get statistics coming in. Most of them are focused on bees, on those pollinators. Uh, we have 50% of our Midwest native bees have, have disappeared from their historic ranges in the, the last century. We've got four species of bumblebees that have declined 96% just in the last 20, 20 years. So they're not extinct, but they're functionally extinct. They're no longer common enough to be performing their roles in their ecosystems. There's three species of bumblebees that may already be extinct. I mean, you have to not find them for a long time before they're officially declared extinct. But, and 25% of our bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. A lot of data coming in from Europe, 30% of the European uh, orthopterans, the grasshoppers, katydids, and, and crickets are facing extinction. A number of, of very scary statistics from Great Britain uh, with a decline of, of various species of Lepidoptera. Um, the biggest studies have come out of Germany. Uh, one ninth, um, came out a few years ago, We're talking about 79% uh, decline in flying insects since 1989. There are 46 species of moths and butterflies that have already disappeared from Germany. This is the one we should focus on though. Invertebrate abundance, and we're really talking about insects here, has declined 45% globally since 1974. So the little things that run the world, the little things that keep us alive, we've just lost almost half of them something to be concerned about. And of course, as insects decline, so did the birds that, that need them. Uh, and we're starting to measure that as well. We've got 432 species of North American birds that are now threatened with extinction. Not because there's only five left of each, but because the, their population trajectories are declining so quickly. We know that that is the uh, signal of impending extinction, even if they're still common today. Uh, this figure, 3 billion fewer breeding birds today than, than actually it should be 50 years ago, came from Rosenberg et, et al. That's almost a third of our North American bird populations already gone. 
we went to that uh, study, the Rosenberg et al. study that said we lost 3 billion birds and divided the birds up into two groups, the terrestrial birds into two groups, the ones that require insects at some part of their life history and the ones that don't. So things like uh, doves and finches that can actually reproduce on seeds. They didn't lose any numbers in the last 50 years, but the birds that require insects, uh, particularly for breeding, lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as the insects disappear, so do the birds that require them. And this is interesting. You know, two invasive birds that we have here, the English sparrow and, and the starling came from, from England. Both of them are now red listed in England. England, the Great Britain has sterilized its landscapes to the point where these invasive species can't even survive. And it's one of the reasons that uh, the UN is now reporting that uh, we're likely to lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. A million species, not an option, folks. It's not an option. So they report it, but that doesn't mean we can, we can let it happen. Does it matter? Of course it matters. The, the creatures that keep us alive are disappearing. It is time to stop that. You know, it is really tough convincing uh, humans, convincing ourselves, that we need to take action uh, when the, the risk seems to be long-term, when it seems to be something that we should worry about in the future. I mean, look at our response to climate change. Tough to get anybody to do anything. So let's not think about it in terms of what might happen to humans in the long-term. Let's think about it in terms of protecting other animals that require these insects. We're pretty good at doing that. So what I want you to do is, is pretend that you are this bird, hermit warbler. Uh, and you uh, have just finished over overwintering in the uh, Telemachus Mountains of Costa Rica. It is time for you to fly north so that you can breed in the Pacific Northwest. And that means you're going to undergo uh, the most dangerous thing that you will ever do, and that is migration. Predation risks are very high during migration. It's physiologically extremely challenging. You can lose, a uh, migrant will lose 35% of their body weight when they cross the Gulf of Mexico, if they go that direction. Or when they're flying at night, um, they'll go up to 300 miles and they can lose 35 to 50% of their body weight during those flights. So when they stop, they come down for rest, rest stops. They're not resting. They have to eat. They've got to put back that, that energy. So they're gassing up. Uh, all, all physiologically very, very stressful. You might wonder if migration is so hard, why do birds do it? Why did it evolve at all? Well, it evolved for the same reason that anything evolved. The benefits of migrating outweighed the costs of migrating. So what are the benefits of migrating? Migrants have more food. Of course, in the temperate zone, uh, you have a giant flush of, of new leaves, even in, in conifers uh, in the, the spring. And following that flush, of course, are the caterpillars that eat those leaves. Uh, and caterpillars are what's driving the migration of birds, also the, the breeding of most of those birds. That doesn't happen. That seasonal flush of food does not happen in most areas of the tropics. The tropics are very constant. There's a tremendous amount of competition. Uh, so this, this bonanza of insects available uh, for birds in the temperate zone gave them an opportunity they don't have if they stay in the tropics. If they stay in the tropics, they can rear two to four offspring per year. But if they fly to the temperate zone, they can make three to six offspring per year. And that was enough to balance those uh, serious costs of, of migration. So let me, let me emphasize, bird migration was only adaptive because there were so many insects that were seasonally available in the temperate zone. How important are insects to birds? Well, this figure came out uh, two years ago. Birds eat 500 million tons of insects each year. And, you know, it's, it's almost amusing to see how they're still selling this statistic. They say, so that means birds are controlling all the pests. They still see insects as, as pests. Let's rewrite that and just say birds require 500 million tons of insects each year. And if we reduce that availability of insects, we're going to reduce the availability of, of birds. So when, migraines, when, when migration evolved, there were plenty of insects in the temperate zone, and it all worked very well. So that's the question. Are there still enough insects in the temperate zone to justify migration? And the answer is, in most places, no, at least every place we measure it. Let's just look at what happens uh, when we bring in ornamental plants or, or, or non-native plants and replace the native plants that are generating all those insects. 
what happens to insect populations. Um, we've done a number of, we've studied this for almost 15 years now, and this is one of our recent studies. Went into hedgerows in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware and measured caterpillar abundance in hedgerows that were invaded with non-natives, like autumn olive and multiflora rose and all of those guys, and compared it to hedgerows that were not invaded, almost entirely uh, native. We found a 68% reduction in the number of species of caterpillars, a 91% reduction in the abundance of those caterpillars, and a 96% reduction in the biomass, the actual amount of energy moving through the ecosystem in those hedgerows. So if you think of this as bird food, we've reduced bird food by 96%. Uh, so does that affect uh, just a few obscure bird species? Not at all. There are 386 species of neotropical migrants in North America that may no longer have enough insects to justify that migration. We're talking about our swallows and our swifts, our orioles, our hummingbirds, our vireos, our tanagers, our buntings, our flycatchers, our thrushes, our warblers. And don't forget all of the, the resident birds that need those insects to reproduce, even though they're overwintering and many of them eat seeds during the winter. When they're rearing their young, most of their baby birds cannot eat seeds, so they have to switch to insects. Chickadees, for example, all of the species of chickadees are rearing their young on insects. Most of them are caterpillars, and it's not just a few insects. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars required to make one clutch of Carolina chickadees, depending on the number of, of uh, birds in the nest. And that's just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. After they leave the nest, the, bird, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of, of bird. And if we create landscapes that don't have that many caterpillars in them, that's called insect decline. And that, of course, is leading to, to bird declines. Remember, the chickadees forage only about 50 meters from the nest. If you want chickadees breeding in your yard, you've got to have what they need in your yard. They're not going to fly five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. So when we put in ornamental plants like ginkgos that produce zero caterpillars, you're starving the birds, either the migrants or the resident birds. What if I said to you, introduced plants are reducing your bank account by 96%. I'll bet that would get your, your attention. And I'll bet you wouldn't tolerate, you certainly wouldn't be buying these at, at uh, your nurseries if that was what was happening. Well, insects are the currency in our ecological bank account. We need to start taking them a lot more seriously. It's our ecological bank account that keeps us alive. Seems dramatic, but that's the way it is. So our only viable option really is to, is to learn how to live in harmony with the natural world that sustains us. To live sustainably, we use that word a lot, but what's the alternative? Unsustainable? Um, no, it's not an alternative. How are we going to do this? Uh, well, one thing we need to focus on that we has not gotten enough attention is private property. 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned, and 78% of the, the entire country is privately owned. If we don't do conservation, if we don't make insects on private property, we're going to fail. Uh, because it's most, of the, it's most of the country. The, the areas that are protected uh, and in relatively good shape are too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. So when we design landscapes like this, um, where we, you know, those are totally ecologically dead landscapes, we've got to redesign them in ways that actually support insect population. First, we have to understand what is causing the declines of insects. Uh, it's been described as death by a thousand cuts because there's so many different causes of insect declines. The misuse and overuse of pesticides, habitat loss, you know, that, that picture I just showed you with habitat loss for sure. Those non-native ornamentals or, or uh, well, any of the non-native plants, whether they're ornamental or not, um, are not generating enough insects. And they become invasive species that don't generate insects. Light pollution is killing a lot of insects. And of course, we have climate change. This is actually good news, folks, because these five are relatively easy to address. I'm not going to make the assignment that you have to fix climate change by tomorrow, but you can. You can, you can address each one of these starting as soon as I finish my talk. So what we have to do is we have to raise the bar about what we ask our private properties to do, what we ask our landscapes to do. Uh, in the past, we've, we've asked them to be pretty. It was a single goal, so we, we ran around the world and found the prettiest plants. We thought plants were just decorations. We didn't consider their ecological roles at all. So, you know, 
they can be pretty, they can be screens, anchors, or focal points, but it was all about aesthetics. And you created, we created beautiful landscapes, but uh, that equaled ecological destruction. Let's turn that on its head. Let's find beautiful plants that uh, do uh, have, have uh, ecological value. They support those insects, support the food webs, protect our watershed, store carbon, uh, support uh, all the pollinators that everybody's talking about, the natural enemies that, that keep that we do have pests, keep them in, in uh, check. In other words, deliver ecosystem services. When we include function in our plant choice, um, then landscaping equals ecological restoration. Um, I think this is 21st century landscaping here. We've done 20th century landscaping uh, for the last 100 years, and we're now in the sixth grade extinction. So I I'm going to say that's not working. Let's give 21st century landscaping a try. All right, what does this have to do with making insects? We cannot restore ecosystem functions on any landscape without restoring the insect populations that need to be there. So how do we do that? First, we have to decide which insects we're going to make. There are a lot of insects out there. And we're not going to have all of them on all of our properties. Three to four million species suspected worldwide. Um, more than, than uh, half are still undescribed. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're going extinct before we even describe them. We've got 164,000 described species in the US, but uh, I still can find uh, insects uh, at my house at our property right here in Pennsylvania that have not been described. So uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. But let's, let's simplify, let's divide all of those insects into the two most important groups that we have to focus on. Um, and I'm going to say it's the insects that maintain plant diversity. Remember, plants are capturing energy from the sun, turning it into food. They're essential. We need to maintain those plants. So we need the insects that help us do that. And then we need the insects that take the energy, the food that those plants have created from the plant and deliver it to uh, other animals so that we have the animals that run the ecosystems that support us. So we're talking about pollinators. You all know about pollinators, essential in keeping our, our, uh, our flowering plants going. But then the other group is caterpillars. And this is the one that doesn't get very much attention. So first, let's talk about pollinators. First, let's define what a pollinator is. Now, let's talk about why we need pollinators. Then we'll talk about what a pollinator is. Of course, the standard line is that, that uh, pollinators are, are pollinating a third of our, our crops, and therefore, there we need them. Um, you know, I don't, I don't like that description. First of all, it's not accurate. It's really about a twelfth of our crops uh, that are that depend on insect po pollination. Um, and also, people, if people don't live next to a farm, they say, "Well, I don't need any pollinators because uh, there are no crops near me." So let's look at it a little bit more broadly. We need pollinators because they pollinate eighty percent of all plants. The others are wind pollinated, and ninety percent of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. That is not an option. Nothing to do with agriculture. We need our pollinators just to keep the plants around. We are not talking about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. Absolutely essential to keep those pollinators around. Okay, now what is a pollinator? A lot of people think that any insect you see on a plant is a pollinator. Um, but actually, most of those we call flower visitors. They are visiting, visiting the flower, they're, they're drinking the nectar, they're using the pollen. But unless you transfer the pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower, you're not actually acting like a pollinator. And most flower visitors do not pollinate. It doesn't make them bad. Uh, it just means that they're using what's, what's there without uh, giving anything back. Okay, who are our major pollinators? First of all, there are lots of insects that do pollinate, but most of them are fairly minor. The major ones include, of course, the honeybee, the introduced honeybee, which is a very good generalist pollinator, uh, and it addresses the needs of many of our introduced crops. We also have 4,000 species of native bees, the ones that did the bulk of the pollination in North America before we brought the honeybee over. Um, so these guys know how to do it. They're good at it. We also have up to 14,000 species of moths and butterflies, about 2,000 undescribed at this point. Um, butterflies typically are lousy pollinators. Um, I know we want to save the monarch because it's a pollinator. It's really not, but saving the monarch is still a good idea anyway. But a number of our moths are pretty good, and, and um, much of this pollination happens at night when we don't see it. So this is an underappreciated group of, of pollinators that needs to be saved as well. 
Let's first talk about the, the 4,000 species of native bees. You know, when I, when I give talks and I tell people, you need to create habitat for bees in your yard so that we can increase, uh, have a complex community of, of pollinators in your yard. People say, no, nope, I'm not gonna do that because I will get stung. And I say, no, no, our native bees, you know, most of them are solitary. They're not aggressive. They're not defending a hive. You can pet them when they're on a flower. Everything's fine. And they say, no, you're wrong. I was stung last week. What they're talking about is typically not a bee at all. It's a, often a yellow jacket or sometimes a, a hornet. Um, these are wasps, these are not bees. Uh, and they are aggressive and they are defending a social hive uh, and they'll chase you down and sting you. I'm not talking about having these guys in our yard. Um, they're, they're predators and they actually eat a lot of the caterpillars that I like so much. So we're talking about native bees that are herbivores. They're, they depend on pollen and nectar. Um, they th really, they will sting, but rarely, um, they're not aggressive at all. So how do we make native bees? In other words, you can have them in your yard very safely. Okay, they need a place to live and something to eat. That's, that's self-evidence. But where, where do native bees nest? Three main places, the ground, woody stems or pithy stems. Let's first talk about our ground nesters because most of our native bees are ground nesters. 70% of them nest in the ground. They sink a, a, a vertical shaft uh, like a mine with little offshoots to the side. Uh, and it's usually a, a single female that will do that. And then she'll pack those offshoots with pollen and lay an egg on it and, and rear her young. So uh, if you, uh, on your property, if you own any ground, and I'll bet you do, um, you can have ground nesting bees. They prefer a slight south facing slope. Uh, they prefer uh, a, a little bit of an open area that doesn't have a lot of vegetation. It doesn't have to be big, you know, four or five square inches is enough for, for a bee. And this is what they look like. This is a Kalides bee. They're very shy, they hide in their tunnel. If they come out and the, a shadow hits them, they dive back in again. Um, so that's what they're what the ground nesting bees doing. Uh, pithy stem nesters or woody stem nesters make cells within those those uh, stems. They hollow out the stems. This is a picture from Heather Home. Pack them full of pollen and then make success. Come back here. Oh, come back here. Make uh, successive cells uh, that are younger. Each one's younger. So this one is the oldest. So this is what a bee larva looks like. Not like much. Um, it's simply there eating the pollen. And when it matures, it you know, pupate right here and then tunnel out through the side and leave a little hole. This one's a little bit younger, this one's a little bit younger and they go right on, right on down. Uh, so what are those pithy stems? Those are the, that's the herbaceous plants that grow up in a typical meadow where many of our, our flowering plants that we have in our yards. Um, it, you know, we used to think that uh, they, they spent the winter in these, these uh, dead stalks, so we want to preserve them. It's a little bit more complicated like that. And this is a graphic that Heather Homa has, has worked up. Um, it's small, but, but follow me here. In the winter, you want to leave all the flower, the dead flower stalks up there. Because first of all, those are the seeds that maintain the, the birds that don't go to your feeders, all the sparrows and all those guys that are eating seeds in the ground. If you cut them off in the fall, you've eliminated all of them. So you leave them in the winter time. Then in the spring, you cut them back maybe eight to 24 inches high. Um, so you're leaving, uh, it looks like a straw. Those are the areas that are going to be the nest sites for the pithy stem nesters. The bees will come and they, they build uh, uh, those successive uh, cells in those, those uh, dead stalks. So it's last year's stalks. Then the new growth grows up and, and you don't even see those stalks anymore. So it's not gonna be ugly, um, but that's where the bee larvae are developing in those the dead stalks from the previous summer. Then in the fall, again, you don't cut it back in the fall, but in the winter time, um, well, that's in the winter time. The, uh, the bees are spending the winter in that last year's stalks. And then in the spring, they will emerge. Uh, and that's when you can cut back uh, the this year's stalks, if you're following me here. So, it, so there's a year delay there. And that's why mowing things down to the ground is uh, a great way to get rid of all your bees. Woody stem nester is very similar. This is elderberry, for example. It's got soft wood. Uh, and here the bees have already left. They tunnel out through it. But uh, it's a great, uh, great thing to leave for our woody, woody stem nesters because it is so soft. But what do we do when we have an elderberry bush and a branch dies? We cut it off because, because we're neat. Uh, a dead stem does, doesn't look 
look nice. Well, then you've just eliminated the nesting opportunity for, for your woody stem nesters. Uh, we've partially replaced uh, the need for, for, we call it coarse woody debris around your property by inventing bee hotels. Uh, and humans have a lot of fun with bee hotels. We make all different uh, sizes. They're essentially holes that uh, those, those um, stem nesters can, can uh, nest in. Uh, and some people go go crazy with it. So this is a whole lot more fun for the, the person than it is for the bees. They will use it. Uh, but research is showing that large bee hotels are, uh, are not a good idea. Why? You're putting all your bees in one basket. And if a predator or a disease finds that basket, uh, they wipe them all out. So it is much better to have small, not so fun bee hotels, but many of them scattered around your property. You want to protect them from rain, uh, but those those will be the ones that your, your bees use each year. Okay, what do bees need to reproduce? They need pollen and they need nectar and they need it all the time. Um, here's a distribution of native bee species in New England. They, New England is pretty cold. They come out in March. They're there all the way through November. And you need flowering plants, forage for those bees that entire time. That's the most challenging thing about keeping pollinators around is having what they need um, the entire time that they're around. So what species of plants should we, we use for our native bees? Sam Drogi is, is Mr. Uh, native Bee. And he says, we need to meet the needs of our specialist bees. Uh, because the generalist bees can use the plants that the specialists need, but the specialist bees cannot use the plants that the generalists use. So if you don't plant for the specialists, you've lost all those specialist bees. And about a third of our, our native bees, so you know, 1,300, 1,400 species are highly specialized on particular, uh, usually genera of, of plants. Why are they specialized? Because plants differ in so many different ways. They flower at different times. They smell and look differently. The pollen morphology is, is species specific. And all these little nooks and crannies here, all these little nungies on the, on the uh, pollen are designed to grab the hairs of particular species of bees so that those bees, the specialists, transfer pollen better than anything else. And the nutritional value of pollen uh, varies greatly. So all that variation creates the opportunity for specialization among our bee species. Uh, in in uh, the Pacific Northwest, these are the primary genera that support the most specialist bees. Um, and if you plant these, you can have, let's say you have three or four of these genera in your yard, you can easily have over 40 species of, of uh, specialist bees that you won't have if you don't have those plants in your yard. Um, you'll always have those generalist bees and people see a few honeybees and a few bumblebees and they say, oh, I'm helping all the pollinators. You're helping a few generalists and missing most of the species that really need your help. Okay, that's all we have time to talk about for pollinators. Let's talk about caterpillars, which Nobody else talks about. Um, they're the bread and butter of terrestrial food webs. They're the ones taking the energy from the leaves and delivering it to animals. Uh, and it turns out the caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of insect, any other type of, of animal, period. Most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat something, they ate plants, and that something is typically caterpillars. So if we don't design landscapes that support a lot of caterpillars, we have a failed food web and you know that that's not a functioning ecosystem new way of thinking about the goal of, of landscaping making caterpillars how do we make caterpillars in our yard how do we increase the numbers uh, well you do that by adding the plants that that support those caterpillars and that seems easy enough but there is a catch and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars so we have to be fussy about which plants we choose. And we have to be fussy because the caterpillars themselves are fussy. We have to choose the ones that the caterpillars like. Why is that? Uh, well, plants have made them fussy because plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected chemically. But insects do eat plants. How do they do that? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat the plants uh, on which they have developed or for which they have developed very specialized adaptations. Every plant lineage that's out there 
protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And an insect species can't adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two that are really similar and they develop the enzymes that are, that are good at storing and, and excreting and detoxifying those particular chemicals, the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize uh, the caterpillar's exposure to those, those compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary history with the plant lineage for all those adaptations to fall into place. And when they do fall into place, the insects locked into eating that particular plant lineage. So when we bring in plants from other continents, our insects can't use them. These are all generalizations, but that's what's happening most of the time. Um, so for example, you know, if you plant crepe myrtle, beautiful plant, but it's a decoration. It's like a, it's like a statue there. It's not supporting any of the herbivores uh, because our herbivores are not adapted to eating the chemicals that are, that are in that plant. Um, so here's an interesting twist. Uh, I know that in the Pacific Northwest, you know, you've got a very benign uh, climate. You can grow plants from almost anywhere. And many of the plants, particularly the street trees, are trees from the east. And a lot of people say, well, they're native plants. Here's northern red oak grown in Oxford, Pennsylvania versus Portland, Oregon. And here's the uh, average amount of leaf area eaten. In other words, the amount of caterpillar uh, use of these plants. Uh, and there's a, what did I calculate, a 77% reduction in caterpillar use when northern red oak, which is an eastern tree, is grown in the Pacific Northwest. So it's, it's not native to your particular area, um, even though it's native to, to North America. You have to grow it within uh, the ecoregion in which uh, it evolved in order for it to support the food webs that we're trying to support. All I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild the food webs. On. Okay, you. sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, we're talking about the, the plants that support a lot of insects. This is, this is the beautiful utility. It's even on poison ivy. And I know people don't like poison ivy, but you know when you get poison ivy is when you try to get rid of it. Just ignore it and you can produce the beautiful utilia. Persimmon will give us the sculptured moth. The black gum gives us the Hebrew. Um, our ash, you know, ash is clobbered with the emerald ash borer, but there's a number of big sphinx moths that uh, are supported by ash, like the fawn sphinx. I think that's art in the garden. That's, that's beautiful. Other beautiful things, rosy maple moth on maple, royal walnut moth on, on uh, walnut and hickory. You know, this, this poor guy is already extirpated from New England. Um, that's called insect loss. Double tooth prominent on elm, we can go on and on the witch hazel dagger moth on witch hazel. Pines are really important, uh, which is good for the, for the West. Things like uh, there's a number of species of, of imperial moths on pine. Uh, our native clematis support the spotted thyrus. Two-toned ancillus on ironwood, lost, but, lost owlis, owlet on buttonbush. Native willows are very, very important plants and they support lots of insects like the herald. Um, snowberry clearwing on coral honeysuckle, that's the native honeysuckle. Evening primrose moth is on evening primrose, believe it or not. And the, the adult spends the day with its head stuffed in these, these flowers. Showy emeralds on sumac. I'm not talking about poison sumac. I'm talking about uh, staghorn sumac or smooth sumac. They're great soil stabilizers. You never need to get a non-native plant to stabilize our soil. Uh, our native plants do it really, really well. And then there's certain powerhouse plants. I call them keystone uh, plants like native prunus. They'll give us the uh, uh, white furcula, the crocus geometer, the io moth, the cecropia moth, the colorful zaley, the tufted bird dropping moth. I mean, you have fun just saying its name if you have that on your property. The paddle caterpillar. Send your kids out and, and tell them to find a caterpillar, a paddle caterpillar, and, and tell them to Figure out what those paddles are for. Don't give them the answer. Let them think about it. There's not an app to figure it out. It's the same reason that the filament geometer has these filaments up there. And I'm not going to tell you what it is either because I want you to figure it out. Small-eyed sphinx, these guys are all on native prunus. The Harris's three-spot, which has a holds an umbrella of its shed uh, head capsules over its head. And if you come up and touch it, it whips, whips it around and, and slaps you with it. 
Um, and then oak, which is the most powerful plant in North America in terms of creating the caterpillars that run our food webs, uh, will give us things like the hag moth that thinks it's a tarantula, the red wash prominent, the white dotted prominent, the spiny oak caterpillar, the skiff moth, the white blotched heterocampa, the oak skeletonizer, the solitary oak leaf miner, the half oval ancillus, the pink striped oak worm, and my favorite, the spun glass slug. And then literally hundreds more species are on our oaks. And that's why I call oaks keystone plants as well. You know, 5%, just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. Those are the keystone plants that are essential in our landscapes. Uh, when we're restoring a landscape, we're building an ecological house. And keystone plants are the, are the two by fours of that house. If you, if you, uh, I mean, the house is going to fall down without the two by fours. They're essential. You can't build a house out of out of wallpaper. So a keystone. Remember, this is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take it out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses. Willows, uh, as you move north uh, in the Pacific Northwest past uh, where oaks are important, uh, they become the key, uh, the best keystone plant. 339 caterpillar species supported by willows in Oregon. So where did I take all the pictures I just showed you? I took them in our yard. And this is what our yard looked like when we moved in. It was a, a farm that was broken up and sold. Not many plants there, but um, we put plants back and uh, four years ago, I started to take a picture of every moth species I could find in our yard because I know they're so important in restoring the biodiversity of our yard. I'm up to 1,081 moth species that I have taken uh, uh, pictures of. So, and I'm still at it, still at it. Now we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land area, we've got 40% of all the moth species that occur in Pennsylvania. And we have them because we planted the plants that support them. Um, you don't have to memorize all these, but you put the plants back that are best at supporting these, these caterpillars. And because we put all these plants that make caterpillars back, we've got breeding birds that require those, those caterpillars. We've got wood thrush now because we've got Virginia creeper making the lettered sphinx. We've got indigo bunnings because we have alders making ruby quakers. We've got chipping sparrows because we have black walnut making gray edge boma locus. Field sparrows because we have oaks making red line panopotas. Tip mice, tufted tip mice because we have black cherries making dowdy pinions. Phoebes because we have native grasses making skippers. Robins, of course, because all those weeds, they're really good native plants. Uh, they're making things like the white line sphinx. We've got Carolina chickadees because we've got tulip trees making tulip tree beauties, white eyed vireos because we have spice bush making spice bush swallowtail, house wrens because we have hickories making copper underwings, and of course, bluebirds because we have sycamores making drab prominence. We've got 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, which is 39% of all the terrestrial birds in all of Pennsylvania, right here on little old 10 acres because we put the plants back. So by choosing the right plants and using more of them, we can restore insects uh, and the animals that depend on them nearly everywhere. So I'm gonna leave you with nine things that uh, can help you restore the ecosystem in your yard by restoring the insect populations in your, in your yard. And I'm gonna start with reducing the area we have in, in lawn. Now I know uh, that, that uh, much of the West is not the major um, problem with, with lawns, but nationwide, we've got over 40 million acres of lawn and that's a 2005 statistic. So it's actually much more than that now. Um, that's the size of New England dedicated to an ecologically dead landscape. And we have that because lawn is a status symbol and we humans need our status symbols. But I'm suggesting we cut the area of, of lawn in half by putting those, those keystone plants and other important native plants in the other half. The area of lawn we keep can still be manicured. Um, it, we can still be good citizens, show that, that uh, we're following the cultural norms, but we're gonna put plants back where, where we live. You know, I drove, drove by this church in Mississippi uh, a few years ago, and it struck me that, that uh, everybody's inside worshiping God's creation, and on the outside, they're killing them all. We're not thinking about what those creations actually require. If we cut half the area of, of lawn, if we cut the lawn 
the 40 million acres in half, that'll give us 20 million acres to, to work with. And, and if we do that at home, we can create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. Uh, you can join Homegrown National Park, go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org. Um, and be one of the people that cuts the area of lawn in, in half. Uh, this is our, our attempt at social media. It doesn't cost you anything, but it's a national effort to, to uh, really uh, re replant that 20 million acres in, in the US. So check it out. Okay, we need to plant for specialist bees. We talked about that. We need to remove invasive plants from our property. Um, you know, we've got a big problem from invasive plants in every state of the union, including Oregon, English ivy, you know, it's banned in Oregon now, but um, too late. The barn, the, the, you know, we shut the barn door well after the horses is, is out. It just means you can't go buy it anymore. But you, if it's on your property, do your best to get rid of it. Butterfly bush and expanding uh, um, in, invasive. Um, so all kinds of, this is just a short lift. These plants from other continents are spreading in our natural areas, displacing the native plants that support the insects, that support the food webs, that support everything else. That's why we need to focus on getting rid of them. And that includes a Himalaya uh, um, blackberry. And you know about that too. Use those keystone plants that we talked about. How do you find out what the keystone plants are for your county? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the rank list of uh, the most powerful plants in terms of supporting the, the food web will pop up for your county. Um, so this is uh, what a typical list in, in Oregon would look like. But you know, Oregon's tricky with the, with the mountains. You're on the east side or the west side, the dry side, the wet side. So it depends on where you where you are, but these would be very important er, herbaceous plants as well. Um, notice that I say uh, like native cherries, native oaks, native willows. If you go to the nursery and say, I want to buy a cherry, they're going to sell you an ornamental cherry from Asia. If you want to buy a willow, they'll sell you a weeping willow from, from Turkey. If you want to buy a birch, it'll be a, a European birch. Specify that you want a native uh, you want a native oak. That's going to be Quercus gariana. That's the only one you've got up there. Um, you know, Quercus gariana, the, uh, the Oregon white oak has lost, I think it's 97% of its range due to agriculture. We need to put these guys back. So if you if you get the native members of these, these important genera, you can increase caterpillar use by 65%. We've done that experiment. Landscape for caterpillars. This is an important one. We're just starting to work on this now. But... Um, what I mean by that is this. Now, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 510 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from the, the branch, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. And I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Most species, uh, the caterpillars finish growing on the tree and then they drop from the tree and they wiggle their way beneath the soil if they can and they pupate underground or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree and we mow and compact our soil so that most places it's rock hard and the caterpillars can't get underground, which means our typical landscaping because ecological becomes ecological traps. We call on the adult moths to lay their eggs. The caterpillars develop, they drop down and they die. I am convinced that this is one of the major causes of, of uh, insect declines, um, certainly in, in North America. And of course the, the cement landscape is even less of a viable option. This is what most people do. They have a tree in a, in a typical yard and nobody's measured how well the caterpillars do in a situation like that, although we're doing that this summer. But I guarantee they're gonna do better in a situation like this where you have a layered landscape. You've got your tree and then you've got other plants, maybe a, a, a dogwood here, your Pacific dogwood is great. Uh, native azaleas, then ferns and ground cover. The soil's not compacted. These are safe sites. The caterpillars can fall down here. They can easily get beneath the ground and pupate, or they can spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's there. Ferns are excellent ground covers that protect uh, the, uh, the final life stage, that pupil stage of, of your local moths. Reduce your light pollution. There's, there's research from all over, uh, well, at least the temperate zone. Most of it's from Europe telling us that um, we've identified a really important source of insect decline. It's, it's the lights we have on at night. Lights kill uh, moths and they kill them in about six different ways. Um, so 
that's actually good news to me because we've got to turn around uh, insect declines. And if we can do it simply by turning off our lights at night, we're getting off easy. There's nothing easier than flipping a switch. But I know what you're going to say. You can't turn that light off over your garage because uh, the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it so that it um, only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to recognize is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is the most effective because for some reason, yellow uh, wavelengths don't attract uh, uh, particularly moths the way white wavelengths do. If we switched out our white bulbs and our security lights with yellow bulbs, overnight we would save billions of insects. And if they were LEDs, we'd save billions of dollars too because they're much more energy efficient. Minimize insecticide use. Um, you know, we, we uh, I don't think you guys are, are uh, responsible for this, but over much of the country, we do a lot of mosquito spraying, uh, which does not control mosquitoes, by the way. Um, and homeowners use a tremendous amount of, of uh, insecticides. And if you don't believe me, go to the hardware store and look at all the, the stuff that's on those shelves there that's encouraging you to buy, to buy and then spray anything you see moving around your, your house. Um, everything except uh, control of termites is, well, it's, completely unnecessary. You're, you're being duped into using this. You're also uh, creating a, a, an envelope of uh, poison and living in it when you spray this stuff around your house. Um, so don't fall for that. Just, just tolerate the insects you see. Uh, the spiders in your house, by the way, they're not insects, but they're eating the mosquitoes that we otherwise pay mosquito joe to spray. So tolerate them. Uh, and then finally, well, there you go. The, the, uh, we, don't, we don't need home pesticides. Um, a lot of people say, well, I, we can't do any of the things you're suggesting because our homeowners association, our HOA or our civic association has all these rules and uh, it prevents us from, from um, you know, from using native plants or, or uh, reducing the area of lawn and so on. Join your HOA and change from within. Those rules were made by people. They were made back in the 70s and 60s when people were leaving rusty cars in their front yard and neighborhoods wanted to elevate their status. They said, nope, you're not allowed to do that if you're going to live here. And then they expanded it to how you're going to landscape. Everybody had to be uh, have a landscape that's identical um, without considering the ecological damage that was doing. Um, well, we know a lot more now. Uh, and since people made those rules, people can change those rules. So we are people, join your HOA, educate them uh, and, and change those rules so that it's not, you don't get fined if you have some native plants in your, in your yard. Okay, wrapping up now, I wanna return uh, the way I started and that's with, with uh, E.O. Wilson. Uh, he has written a book a year for a long time. He's 92 now, he's still writing a book a year. But in 2016, this is the book that he published. It's called Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for, for Life. You know, one of the things that, that EO has, has focused on in his career, there's many things, but saving biodiversity has been a primary focus for, you know, 50 years. And this book outlines the science that says in order to save all of life on Earth, we have to preserve ecosystem function on half of the planet. And he, he tells you the science that supports that conclusion. And then he ends the book. He doesn't really tell us a whole lot about how we're going to preserve ecosystem function on half the planet. Um, remember, half the planet right now is agriculture and we're not gonna get rid of that. So what he's really talking about is preserving ecosystem function where we've got 7.8 billion people, all of the infrastructure, our airports and our malls and our roads and everything else. How could that be possible? You know, every, people want to do it, but they're all scratching their heads and wondering if EO has gone crazy. Well, he hasn't gone crazy. I, I think we can uh, realize EO's dream, um, but I think we need, I know we need a new approach to conservation. The old approach to conservation was to uh, persist in our belief that humans and nature cannot coexist. We would carve out areas of the planet and protect them and get rid of humans, and that's where nature would be. Uh, but that has proven to, to uh, not be good enough because those areas are too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species that we're trying to protect. So we have to give up that notion that humans and nature can't coexist. We can coexist in the same place at the same time.
it doesn't mean that you have to save nature, you have to save insects for a living, but you can save them where you live. How do you do that? You can shrink your lawn, you can get rid of your invasive species, you can plant pollinator gardens, you can use keystone plants, you can revitalize the ecosystem right where you live. We can do the same thing in corporate landscapes, we can do the same thing on roadways, we can do the same thing in airports. Um, so, so this coexistence really is, is possible. Insect decline is a global problem, but it has a grassroots solution. Don't look to government to, to solve this. Um, you as a member of planet Earth uh, can manipulate part of the Earth. If you own property, that's where you should be, be working. That's a no brainer. If you don't own property, volunteer and help somebody who does. But we all have a very important conservation role. Um, so we created this problem of insect decline. We can solve it. Thanks very much.